the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, Tyson, you know, we're all on self-quarantine, but yesterday was a nice sunny day here in St. Louis, so I have a funny story for you. Let's hear it. So I went home early. I had to stop by to get my son's medicine from the grocery store. I did a little bit of grocery shopping, and things seemed somewhat normal. And then I got home, and everyone was in the backyard sitting around the pool and in the pool. And so I brought in all the groceries, and then I went upstairs and put on my swim trunks, and I snuck around the side of the house. And I came running around the side of the house. I ran down the diving board and I did a huge cannonball right into the pool. But I turned, my body turns. You know how usually if you do a cannonball, you want to go feet first. But I went like flat. So it was like a huge cannonball. And like all this water went out of the pool and the kids went crazy. I, I'm not surprised. Did you have like a big like red belly? It was like a like uh, little yeah. cannonball. Yeah. And I have. I have a patriotic American flag swim trunk, so you can get the whole picture. It was quite the quite the scene. <laughs> That's pretty. It was awesome. a highlight of my day. I love it. I love it. I don't have the pool yet. I'm working on it, but uh, I can't wait to do that. It's exciting still. All right, um, well, let's not keep our guests waiting any longer. We've been farting around with the technology, so let's get to it. Go for it. All right, so our guest today is John Cannon. He's a listener to the show. He reached out to us about coming on. He's the owner and co-founder, or the owner and founder of Cannon and Associates. It's a firm in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and they are advocates for families and freedom. He's a former prosecutor, public defender, and assistant attorney general. His firm focuses on criminal defense, personal injury, and family law. And he's also he serves as a judge advocate in the Oklahoma National Guard, currently assigned to the 45th Infantry Brigade. And we thank him for his service. John, welcome to the show. Good morning, Jim. Thank you for having me. All right. So, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, everyone wants to listen to the live broadcast and I just can't get it to work. So sorry, buddy. All right. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are. And, uh, now, Jim just gave us sort of like, a, you know, your basic resume sort of, uh, of uh, overview of, of your career. But dig a little deeper on that and tell us how you got to where you are right now. Yeah. Quick sidebar before I do that, Jim. That funny is so appropriate. My nickname growing up was John Paul Cannonball, and then the day that I come oh, on your sure. show, you tell a story about doing a cannonball. Sure. Uh, so I, I graduated law school, decided I wanted to try cases, and I was a district attorney and didn't like that side of the V, so I became a public defender and tried a ton of cases and had an opportunity to do civil litigation for the attorney general, did that, and then the National Guard offered me a full-time job that allowed me to do work outside that didn't conflict. So I was a full-time litigator for the National Guard as a judge advocate and t- started taking private cases and really enjoyed the thought of someone choosing me over someone else to represent them and relying on me and had a friend that does web design and he helped me get that ball started and enjoy writing and website grew and grew and grew. And as it did, started getting more and more leads reaching out and decided I want to do that full time and just been riding the lightning ever since. Riding the lightning. I like it. John, tell us about the legal community in Oklahoma City. Was it hard to sort of gain gain traction as a newer lawyer? Oh, well, I started out, you know, seven, eight years of being a, a government attorney or government hack, depending on your perspective, and uh, tried a bunch of cases, got very comfortable at the courtroom, 
uh, and as a judge advocate, you know, got to represent a number of soldiers in a variety of contexts and really grew from there. So when I decided to pull the trigger and go out on my own, it, I had a lot of experience in court and had developed pretty good relationships with the bench and the bar, but I hadn't yet had any of the business experience or, you know, somebody handing me a file said, here, go, go handle this case. It was brand new to me to someone reaching out, doing intake, having clients retain me, handle the business side. So what's your staff set up again? So currently we have a a legal administrator that's a non-lawyer. I've got a full-time associate and then some part-time attorney work. And then I've got two or three different projects outsourced internationally and a couple of law students to work for me on a part-time basis, and then a variety of contractors to do things for my firm. So really three people in the office uh, was about to hire a full-time paralegal, and then that got paused for the moment, but we'll be adding on a fourth full-time person hopefully next month, maybe, maybe after. We'll see what the forecast of the pandemic is. And so what is your favorite part of working in the firm? What do you like to focus on yourself, John? There's really a a number of things. One, I love working on complex criminal cases and plaintiff cases. So really getting into the nut and bolts of litigation, uh, not not just bringing a client, do a little packet and do a plea or, you know, a a simple divorce. I really enjoy the cases that dive deep into pretrial litigation and trial and even appeals. And then also on the business side, I've never done that aspect before. But since I've been running my firm, I've really enjoyed what I've identified as seven parts of the business that have to be maintained. And then also, you know, helping to grow the people in, in the bubble and helping them. So what's, what's really interesting to me is like I always struggle with that part of it with balancing. I, I love trying cases. I love the litigation part of it. I love I love dealing with the people. I, I love bringing in the cases. I mean, how do you balance all that? Because I, I find it to be a real struggle. I find it to be a struggle, too. And I do the cop out of saying, oh, because I'm small, it's more difficult. But I think at the point that we've got five, six lawyers, we're larger, that'll be just if not more difficult than to compartmentalize. So what I do is I've got block calendar that I try and abide by, and I make the people I work with and clients respect. And then I've got just a paper planner that I bought off Amazon and it's a weekly monthly planner and every week on Sunday I write out the things that have to get done as like a weekly to-do list business and client wise and then I try and abide by that each morning you know I give myself about 20 minutes with before anybody wants to talk to me before I'm even really awake and I try and complete that for what needs to be done for the day and I put in there you know draft a blog post draft a web page and Tyson, something I've spoken to you offline about previously is how great you do at doing videos for your firm. And that's something that I want to add to my weekly or monthly calendar. I just have been delinquent on getting it added in, but I know it's that simple. Just take So for one, Wednesdays afternoon and Friday all day, I don't allow any appointments unless there's an emergency, which our firm has a definition of. And I don't set any court. However, the family judges love to set Friday morning motion in the dockets and different dockets. And I think it's because they have to be there. So the attorney should have to be there. But I, I blocked out those times for business side of the firm. So that's when I generate content. That's when I do my meetings with people that assist me, kind of like my mindset group. That's when I do the business side. And I've really found difficulty plugging in the business side of my practice anywhere else in the calendar. So, John, you talked about the seven practice, seven parts of your practice you need to focus on. Do you want to talk about a couple of those? Sure. When I decided to go out into private practice, I knew nothing about the business of law. And I've heard on your podcast and a number of other great resources how frustrating it is that law schools don't teach us that, that CLE, I, your guest, I think, two episodes ago spoke on how frustrating it is that bar associations don't want to teach lawyers for when they don't know about the business of law. And so I've, you know, I've considered myself a student and always trying to learn. So I've reached out to a number of different resources and help, it's helped me identify seven parts of the business of my firm. And I try and do work on each of those every week. And so the first is goals. So one of my personal and business goals, the second key aspect is marketing. 
So as I know you all have spoken to before, bringing in the right potential new clients that are ready to move forward with being represented. And then the sales portal or your sales. So how do I identify the right people and how do I get them to move forward? And then production. So how do I create cases and how do we streamline and make that process easier? And then people. So the people that work the firm, the people that help assist the firm. I work with an organization called How to Manage, and they help me a lot in the management aspect. So how do I plan for the future, not just for the emergency today? And then my office space. So what what tools do we use? You know, I use Clio Manage and I use Clio Grow for intake. And I've heard a number of people that like other programs more. And I think there may be better programs out there, but for the most part, those work for us. And then we use Latte so people can do electronic transactions. And then we've got a number of SKUs and KPIs and policies and procedures and trying to continue to grow those. So I don't have to explain how we do ABCD the way I want it done. It's, did you read the procedure on that? Okay, is there something wrong with the procedure? Let's talk about it. Let's fix it so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Because I've found that even the thing that I think I'm most special at, that I'm a bright, shining star in, I can write it out what, why I'm good at that thing. And so trying to develop that to where it's written out how all these things are done and the way we think is the best way. Uh, my associate has you know, 20 years experience in family law. He's a retired Brigadier General in the National Guard. And he's got a ton of family law experience and personal injury experience. So I'm asking him to help me develop all the procedures for how we handle those cases the right way. And then last but not least is financial controls. When I was a government attorney, the financial control was make sure that the government paid my check each month. And then I make sure I pay my mortgage and feed the family along with my wife's income. But now there's so much more to that because I run a business. And so I try and stay on top of our budget. I do a monthly budget where I actually plug in my expenses for the month and make sure that where I want the money to be going is where it is going. Budget variance report, do that each month to see what actually was spent versus what I wanted to be spent or planned on being spent. Cash flow projections, a WIP report, a work in progress report. And that has been incredibly important so far during this time. And I think it will continue to be so because we've got a lot of cases that have trust account balances and there's room to do more work for clients there and generate funds out of trust accounts into the operating account as opposed to having to bring in new clients. And then making sure that cash on hand, trust account balances are accurate. And then we, my, our front desk, our legal administrator also wears the hat of a billing specialist because we are small right now. And so she's responsible for staying on top of uh, AR, AR aging reports and Clio management has a number of helpful tools to look at the optics of current cases and finances. And Clio Grow has a lot of great optics to look at the marketing side. So where are these cases coming from and the number of cases that come from a specific area, the value of those cases, the close rate on those cases, is that matching up with our marketing spend? Because every marketing company that I talk to that reaches out without me wanting them to reach out, they always say, oh, I'll get you the first page of Google or, oh, we'll get you this many leads or, oh, A, B, C, D, sell, sell, sell. Well, that's not accurate. So I found if I don't monitor what's having a return on investment or return an ROE, ROI, sorry, return on investment, that if it's not working, then I cut it off. And so that's a constant process of trying to evaluate what's working to bring in leads. And then the sales is a constant process of how can we make the firm more appealing from the first touch point to the signed contract and the retainer? And those are things that we're constantly trying to spend time to develop. But like Tyson, you said, it's really hard to find the hours in the week to plug those things in. But just being conscious of those aspects has helped me to at least weekly, if not monthly, monitor them. So it's funny because my next question I was going to ask you about like what your strong suit, uh, suit was when it comes to managing your firm. And I think it was pretty clear that you're, you're a numbers kind of a guy. And so I, I'm not even going to ask you, I'm going to skip right over. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to get to a different question because you, you, you all do criminal defense and personal injury and family law. And to me, that seems very, very difficult to market. for. I mean, whenever I did criminal defense, it was hard to, to market both because you know, one hour I'd be talking to a, a criminal defense client and then the next hour I'd be talking to a personal injury client and I'd be telling them both that, you know, talking about how great I was as a personal injury lawyer or criminal defense lawyer. I wasn't really 
doing that. But you know, you, you, whenever you're talking to your client, you're trying to you know make yourself out to be the best that they hire you. And I found it difficult, and it's hard. And whenever uh, your website, you know, it's hard to you know say that you're you, know, you do personal injury and you do a great job of personal injury, but you also do a great job of criminal defense. So. Like, how do you manage that? Like, how, how, like, especially when you're doing three different practice areas, it's got to be difficult. Yeah, it's a struggle. And I'll say that when I went out into private practice, I knew a lot more about criminal law than anything else. And I, I was passionate about that. But I, I decided a lot of research that I found that you can niche, you have to pick a niche or niche, but you need a second one or a backup. And so, like, you know what? I've done a lot of work for soldiers and family law advising them about, you know, the SCRA and USERA and their rights in court and divorce and division of military retirement and child visitation and relocation issues. So I'm going to try family law. And it was scary as hell, but I read a lot and I studied a lot and I spoke to and went to lunch with a lot of great family law attorneys. And I went down when I finished court on some case, I'd go down to the family floor and watch who I had been told or identified as good family law attorneys. And I started to pick it up. And now We've got a pretty much thriving family law practice, and I don't enjoy that work as much. Sorry, any family law clients in my firm that hear that. So my associate handles the majority of the family law, and I've stopped spending any money marketing-wise on family law. But I've got a website with 300-plus pages on it, and we get a lot of family law business just because of our the presence of our website and what the crawlers have identified in the Google search return. So we've stopped marketing to family law, but again, our magic statement, we're fierce advocates for families and freedom. And with that experience, you know, we've got the experience to, when people come to us about family cases, we can speak to their pain points and we can address their issues. On the personal injury side, that's something that I had picked up cases occasionally. A number of my friends know that I did litigation for the attorney general for a little over a year argued cases of the 10th circuit, you know, depositions, interrogatories, trial, everything in between. And if somebody would come to me with an interesting case, I'd say, sure, I'll take that on. And so I've, you know, I've handled four or five cases with friends or referrals that are in the personal injury, excessive force, car accident realm, and really interested in that. And candidly, a big part of why I've added that practice area is one, my associate enjoys it. And two, the hope of, you know, hitting some home runs because there aren't home runs in criminal defense. I mean, I've gotten some fees that are close to forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, but you're never going to represent somebody and make, you know, six figures on their case. And so trying to merge these different areas and not seem like we're a, a general practice firm is something I'm struggling with right now. So I've stopped to spend on a family law marketing I'm not doing new blog posts or new content on family law and trying to turn the focus in our marketing and our social media presence and the networking I'm doing and the research that I'm doing towards personal injury and criminal defense. And I'm 100% behind you, Tyson. I think that you lose something when you spread yourself out too thin. And so there's a, there's a real possibility that come a year from now, we will have family law as an area that we take new clients in. It's kind of been pushed down under the rug as far as what we're putting out to the world with networking, with marketing partners, with social media. When I talk to people in the community, what do I do? And so I think that it's a real problem to have three main practice areas unless you have a a firm of four or five attorneys. And there's a long-winded response, but it's a real pain point is one, I'm the criminal defense guy in this firm. Two, Doug, my associate, is the family law guy in this firm. And three, the personal injury cases, we handle those as a team on every single one of them. So you come to us and you've been injured unlawfully by law enforcement, or you've been hit in a car accident and you're not at fault, or we've got a a brand new nursing home negligence case where a client has 15 by 12 by 4 centimeter inch decubitus ulcers on their sacrum or tailbone, terrible negligence. And the person may pass from that. And so we use our combined experience in that area. And when I bring another attorney and my hope is that they will be maybe the head on criminal defense or personal injury and have really one person that is the, the marketed attorney for that area, but we handle everything as a team. And so far that's been working. I don't know if it's the right answer, but I definitely see the concern in myself and in others and having multiple practice areas. And so we're kind of in just the experimental 
testing phase right now to see if it'll work because I've only added the personal injury prong as a marketed practice area about 30, 45 days ago and been handling those cases for quite some time. My associate for years have got a fair amount of experience but haven't been putting that out to the world. And so far it's been working out, but we'll see in six months where we're at. We'll take a break for a word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsor, Smith AI. Smith AI is a superior receptionist service for law firms, trusted by many maximum lawyers, including me. At my immigration practice, the hacking law practice, Smith's friendly U.S.-based receptionists respond to potential clients in English or Spanish, screen and schedule new leads, and even take payment for our consults. The best part is that they don't just handle these conversations by phone. They also have live agents and chatbots capturing leads on our website through their chat widget. They serve as our friendly gatekeepers while my team and I work uninterrupted. We get new clients and we get work done. How awesome is that? If you're in a solo or small firm, I know you'll appreciate this. Plans start at just $70 a month for calls and $100 a month for chats. They even offer a totally free chatbot, so there's no excuse. Try Smith AI today and see for yourself why attorneys like me say Smith AI receptionists are the secret to business growth. Smith AI offers a free trial and maximum lawyer listeners get an extra $100 discount with promo code MAXLAW100. That's M-A-X-L-A-W-1-0-0. Sign up and learn more at www.smith.ai. Trust me when I say don't let another day go by, try Smith AI. We're back with John Cannon. He's a maximum lawyer group member, and he is a lawyer from Oklahoma City. John, how did you find out about the podcast and the group in the first place? Uh, just continual search, trying to learn and grow. And I, you know, scour podcasts. I've got about a 20 minute drive to and from work and an even longer drive to the courthouse and back, regardless of what courthouse I'm going to, unless it's the municipal courthouse in Edmond, Oklahoma, where our office is. And I fill that time those days with listening to podcasts, trying to learn new information if I'm not on the phone with someone. And, you know, Perpetually do searches for podcasts on law firms and on attorney marketing and lawyer growth and found your podcast. I listened to one of them and I was hooked. And so I've been listening ever since and reached out to Tyson directly just because he's a St. Louis guy and loved Budweiser. Went to the Arch with my wife a couple years ago, been to a Cardinals game, and uh, he was nice enough to let me come and join you guys for a podcast. So we, we, we found the, the part of the practice that you're really, really good at because you talked about it. So what is it that you struggle with the most? What's, what's the most difficult things for you? So I think one of the most difficult things for me would be, I think, penciling in time and sticking to that. I have a block calendar that I really struggle to maintain because of just the volume of court appearances, criminal offense, personal injury, family law are all pretty court appearance heavy, litigation heavy. And so finding time outside of that to do the business of my practice is a real struggle. I think the number one thing I'm failing on at this point is adding substantial and consistent video content. And I've just completely sucked at that. So one of the areas that I know my business needs to grow in, I haven't gotten done. And so that's that's a real struggle point for me. Also, I really, really want to have a written out procedure for everything that we do in the practice and as an organism. So it can change people that work in the practice can help, help improve that. And I've probably got 10 or 15 procedures for internal and external policies, but there's so much more to be done. And so I've got the framework in my head for how all these things should happen, but memorializing them and then putting them in a time and space that everyone that works in the practice will internalize as well or follow them is probably another big struggle area for me. All right, John. Well, we've been in this new reality for a a little while now with the coronavirus and everything, and I'm glad that we were able to talk about your firm sort of pre-virus. And I'm wondering what kind of effect is this having on you? What approach are you taking with your team and how are you handling things? So it's definitely had an effect. The day that the governor of Oklahoma put out that all non-essential businesses are closing and every courthouse in the state would be closed from the Supreme Court to the federal district courts to state district court and down in municipal courts, uh, was a real wake up call. So I wrote a two page letter about what that process looks like and what we think it'll be going forward. 
and I attached the governor's order and I sent it or I had my legal administrator send it to every existing and former client and then created a newsletter. We do a monthly newsletter electronically and thinking about going into the you know paper version of that, that's another topic, but took that letter and notice from the governor and sent it to every person in our contact stream. So what it said basically was for your safety, our safety and moving forward, everything is going to be business as normal. We've got everything backed up and encrypted drive. We've got everything in your file backed up on an online portal, a second online portal. And we've got everything in your case backed up in a paper file and also on multiple computers. So rest assured, no matter what, your information, your files are safe. Two, we're not going to be doing any in-office meetings for the foreseeable future, but you still have full and complete access to us. So you can schedule conferences, you can schedule video conferencing. I know that it's been a hot topic recently. Zoom is something that we're using and just trying to make all of our existing clients rest assured that their case is taken care of, that despite the courthouse being closed, we're continuing to work on your case or with opposing counsel, and everything's going to be fine. And then on the new business side, I've implemented a policy that we're, the door is closed. So unless you work for the firm, excluding our law students, excluding people that do contract work, you're not coming in the door. So we've got a completely closed door policy, but open electronic door policy. So if somebody reaches out to the firm by email or by phone, then we'll respond to them. We'll walk them through our intake procedure. However, as opposed to scheduling an in-office meeting, they can schedule a telephone conference or a video conference. And my preference is video conferencing. I think that it's a closer connection than just speaking to someone on the phone. But as Lee Rosen, the, the brilliant mind he is, said in your conference video call the other day, but a lot of potential clients don't need that. You know, I think that a lot of people have made the decision that they want to hire me or I'm one of the two or three attorneys they're considering hiring. And when they call us and a person answers the phone politely, says, good morning or good afternoon. Thank you for calling Canon Associates. This is Regina. How may I help you? And then actually follows through with caring about that person, building on that know, like, and trust. I think that speaking to one of the attorneys here on the phone is enough. And we've seen a drop off on business, but we only need about three new cases a week in order to hit our KPI. And we've gotten two or three cases this week already. So I think things are going to be fine. But what we've done is we've isolated ourselves from coming into physical contact with anyone, but tried everything we can to maintain the connection electronically. And the Zoom calls haven't been working great so far. And I think that's a disconnect with my staff. And so just trying to sent my staff multiple videos on YouTube, uh, the encyclopedia of our generation of how you do a Zoom call and how easy it is. And the family law section of my bar association put out a how-to on Zoom calls and a how-to on Zoom calls on your cell phone yesterday. And so I blasted that out to my staff, said, hey, we're going to continue to work on doing this. Uh, we've definitely seen a decline in the number of contacts this week, but it hasn't been zero. We've had people reach out, we've done consults, we've had people sign the line electronically, and we've had people retain our firm. And lastly, we've always had in place the ability to do all contracting and agreements and medical authorization releases, all the things that need to be signed electronic, but I hadn't taken the time to really implement that. And so since we've had a little downtime this week, went into Clio Grow, that's our intake software, and created fillable forms, or improved fillable forms for our retainer-based cases, flat fee cases, and contingent cases, medical authorizations, questionnaires, intake forms, contracts, and payment plans. And now those are getting blasted out to new clients. So instead of them at some point having to come into the physical office and sign something or being emailed something that they have to print off, sign, and email or mail back, right now we're only doing electronic contracting, electronic forms. So it gets emailed to this person through our intake software. They can click on a button and put a digital signature on there and it comes back and our states held that to be binding. And so that's just one more way that we distance ourselves from people. It's definitely a struggle. It's definitely concerning, but I'm a man of faith and so very confident that we're all going to get through this fine as long as we make wise decisions on how we interact with people and abide by social distancing. 
And so we're trying to do our best to protect the business and protect others that come in contact with us. It was really kind of interesting. You mentioned early on about sending an email out and Tyler, I think it was Tyler Moth that posted something in Master My Experience, how he sent it out to all of his clients and got a 100% open rate. And so if you want to reach out to your clients right now, this may be a really good time just to send one of those emails. I know that I don't like receiving them right now, but clients might want to receive them from us with that kind of an open rate. So it's kind of interesting. I also find it interesting how this is really transforming a lot of firms. It's forcing people to, you know, redo their systems, you know, move their forms from paper to digital. And, and it really is interesting to me how these firms are having to change. They're being forced to change and they're doing it. And I think it's a good thing. We've been doing all this for years. And it's, so it, it was, there was no changes for us. And it was, for us, it's, you know, we always sign up clients over the phone. We, we don't do the, zone, the Zoom meetings. Clients just don't care about it as much as they used to. They just don't. We always offer them the ability to meet us in person. And nine times out of 10, they don't choose the, the meeting in person. They choose to do everything over the phone and sign the phones via email. So my question to you is, do you think this is going to transform your firm to the point where you're going to keep doing these things that you're doing while the pandemic's going on? Or do you think that you're going to revert back to your old ways once this is over with? I think we're going to change. And I think it's a way that I can get an attorney that's been on the block for 20 years that, you know, maybe a little bit more old school than me. And then staff has never done this before to recognize that in the 21st century, we can be an electronic practice. And so their minds are blown when I show them the capability of doing all these things just electronically. So I think this will help us enforce that this is how we're going to do it going forward. If somebody wants to meet with us in person, then they can. But I think for your firm, Tyson, your web presence is, and I'm not trying to kiss ass, I'm being honest, the number of videos that you've done and the web presence, people have watched those videos before they come to talk to you. And they generally know, like, or trust you if they're, call, if they're picking up the phone. And we've got a couple of videos online, but I want to get to the point that all the aspects of our practice areas are laid out as a resource for people, not just in written form, but in videos. And I think that when you build that presence, People have already made a decision a lot of the time when they pick up the phone and call. You know, it's not 1950s where there's a town lawyer or yellow pages, and so you call and don't know this person from Adam. When somebody calls any of our firms, people listening, they have the opportunity to see our Google reviews, where hopefully hundreds of people have commented about their experience. They have the opportunity to see testimonials, case studies, content banks, questions and answers, blog posts, videos. I mean, the content that we can put out to potential clients to have them know, like, and trust us is exponential. There's no end of the growth trajectory there. And so I think that with the 21st century of how people are finding our firms, deciding if they want to work with us or not, is the catalyst for us not having to meet with people in person anymore. John, for my last question, what was the biggest surprise for you shifting from government attorney job to owning your own firm, and which job would you rather have given the current situation? No question, I'd rather be running a practice. You know, it's allowed my family, my wife is at home with our three children, and close to home, the daycare that our two youngest would have been at has had a positive COVID infection. And so all those children were exposed. I uh, don't know what the outcome of that will be for those kiddos, but my wife being at home has protected us from that. And so that's a huge blessing that the practice has done enough that she can be at home with the littles for the past year and a half. So as to that part of your question, I would definitely choose to continue to do this. The biggest surprise for me is that I am the master of my destiny. So when I work for the government, if I kicked ass on a case, if I won something, if I saved the state money, if I got an acquittal on a murder trial for a public defender client, if I got a conviction in a murder trial for the state, it was a pat on the back and move forward. But in my firm, when you have those successes or when you see the system working, the benefits are perpetual and get to bring people in and help them learn this young attorneys, law students. I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to my alma mater law school on multiple occasions and just the ability to continue that growth is amazing. And I wrote it down here. I wanted to mention before we got off, uh, I recently read Jane Clear's Atomic Habits book and it's just brilliant beyond measure. And, you know, he speaks in that book to habits. And then when we decide the type of person we're going to be, I think he called that, I'm missing it here. 
identity-based outcomes. So I decide I'm going to be the owner of a successful law firm. I decide I'm going to do this. Then we backtrack and build towards that. And so I've decided that I'm going to have a firm that has a policy and procedure for everything that we do. And it's always open for people in my firm to make better. And I decided that I was going to be the author of a book. And I don't know how I did it, but I wrote, you know, a 150 page or so book on criminal defense. And it's done amazing things for my practice. And just, I think that all of us, if we decide on the outcome that we're going to do fine through this COVID experience, that we're going to be adaptable like humans have always been, that we're all going to be just fine. And so I've, I've taken a lot of all this in there and I've tried to focus on I'm the master of my destiny and trying to work every day to serve our clients, but also build, build a bigger and better ship. I love it. All right. We do need to wrap things up. Before I do, I want to remind everyone to go to the Facebook group, get involved there, join us. There's a lot of great activity. As many of you know, we have canceled the conference and we are doing it in 2021. So uh, if you've not heard, now you know. Jimmy, what is your hack of the week? So we talk a lot on here about Brene Brown, the social worker from Houston who has one of the biggest TED Talks of all time and is an author of many books, including one of our favorites, Daring Greatly. I found out yesterday that she has a new podcast that launched about a week ago, and I listened to the first episode. It's terrific. So it's called Unlocking Us, and so I highly recommend it. All right, Jimmy, that's a good one. John, what is your tip or hack of the week? My tip or hack of the week is if you can't do it this month, which we should be able to with things slowing down, block in time for your calendar. Block in an hour, block in four hours. Trust me, you or your staff will be able to work outside of it to do these things that have to be done for the business side. And I found that I had to initially go a month and a half out to put it in the calendar. But now I don't have anything on Wednesday afternoon and I don't have anything all day Friday. And that allows me to put in that white space family and golf and business development. And I think you'll all be, as I've been amazed, that you can still practice and still serve all your clients while you block out time to handle the business side of our practices. You're so right. Time blocking is crucial. And, and, and another part of it is once your team knows, like you blocked it out, but sometimes I think we've all been there where your team sort of sometimes ignores that part of it. But if you say you stress to them, hey, this is important. Don't put anything in that time block. They won't. And so it, it really is helpful. It, it's really, yeah. Can I, yeah, can I just add one thing to that, Tyson? Absolutely. Yeah, when I first put that out to my staff, they're like, what? What do you mean you aren't? They're like, no, no court, no appointments, nothing. Act like I'm not here. And I think it's so important to let people behind the veil and explain to them why those things happen so that they have ownership of it themselves. And so my associate, all the people that I work with know that that's the only way that we continue to grow is I, if I have time to do the business side. And so help them understand why you do the things that you do, because there are things they'll never be able to do. So it's not like you have to hide your precious like like it's the ring and, you know, Lord of the Rings, I'm going to geek out for a second. You can let them understand why you're doing X, Y, or Z. They'll take ownership of it, and they will help you protect your time. Love it. Good stuff. All right. So my tip of the week is I'm going to take it back. I, I don't know if I've ever given this tip before. I know I've spoken about it, but especially in these times right now with what's going on, it's important to celebrate our wins. So as soon as you listen to this, I want you to think about over the last 24 hours, just list three of your wins, you know, and write them down. And, and it really will help change your mindset. If you start your day every morning by just writing down your wins from the last 24 hours, I promise it's going to help change your mood in the mornings. You're, it's it's going to give you that positivity to start your day. And especially if you start with, Gratitude as well, you know, things you're thankful for, but also writing down your wins, celebrating your wins. I think we are, we are trained, it's beaten out of us. We're not supposed to you know, celebrate our wins for some reason. Celebrate your wins. It'll make you feel better. It'll help improve your day. It'll, it'll, it'll help you and help you help other people, really. It really will. So, all right, John, thank you so much for coming on. You definitely know a lot. It, it's great to hear from you, and, and thanks for sharing everything. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye, John. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, go to MaximumLawyer.com. Have a great week and catch you next time.